Hello, Google Clinicians. This is Ali Nassé, and I'm joined today by Dr. Ann Koch. Annie, thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. It's just fun to be back here in Boston. <laughs> so, Annie is visiting Boston for a uh, presentation that you gave a couple of days uh, of lecture and hands-on at the Yankee Dental Center. Absolutely. Dental um, I spoke for six hours on Thursday, Al, and what was amazing, on Thursday morning at 8 a.m., I had a presentation about endodontic challenges facing the young dentist, and I had 72 people in the seats at 8 a.m. 72 people at 8 a.m. That's kind of crazy. It was wonderful. The afternoon session was, was full, and then yesterday we did two hands-on sessions. Uh, both were sold out, and thank you very much for coming along and helping out because I think the hands-on sessions were incredibly productive. No, absolutely, it sure was, and it was great to just see you in action, do uh, a wonderful hands-on, and I, we're going to, at the end of this video, we're going to put together, uh, we have a little segment of a little interview I did with you yesterday at the hands-on about yes. what are some of the things that you have to keep in mind during a hands-on yeah. that we could probably put at the end, people can watch if they're it's, interested. It's all about trying to get the most from a hands-on experience. Exactly, absolutely. So Annie, since uh, we are lucky enough to have you here in Boston visiting uh, for this couple of days, I wanted to have you over so that okay. we can, uh, can share a case with you. This okay. is a kind of a uh, normal, regular case, but has an interesting angle, okay. which I just did today, Saturday, and I know you're leaving uh, tomorrow. <laughs> this case was, I just did on Friday, right. uh, and I, I did finish the editing just a couple of hours okay. ago this morning, and I figured I wanted to share it with you and get your insight about um, some of the different aspects of it. It's a case that I did using the blend protocol, and the blend protocol is actually what you were presenting on, uh, yes. which is a combination. You want to just talk a little bit about well, the, the blend? The, well, the blend protocol is a, is a technique that we've developed at Real World Endo where we're utilizing both non-heat-treated files as well as heat-treated files. Ali and I both think it's the most intuitive technique developed because what we're doing is we're trying to use the metallurgy where best indicated for use. So in a straight part of the canal, we can use a non-heat-treated file, but in areas where we start to get into crazy curvatures or challenging anatomical situations, let's use a heat-treated file. Yeah, I mean, using the, uh, for the straight portion mm -hmm. of the canal, use the canal, the, the, the instrument that is going to give you the most efficiency, and in the apical area where you have curvatures, use something that's gonna give you more flexibility. So, the tooth that I have for you here, Annie, as you can see, it seems to be a run-of-the-mill uh, premolar with a lesion. The lesion appears to be on the side of the tooth. This is a case where a number of restorative work that needed to be done, the prosthodontist, upon making the temporary crowns, noticed that there is a lesion on the side of the tooth and wanted to have it checked, found that the pulps were non-vital and non-responsive to the temperature, although the molar was responsive. So the premolar is the only one. It has a history of a larger filling, as you can see on the side, potentially close exposure on the uh, distal aspect of the pulp horn. And so, um, the patient was sent in to, uh, to evaluate and do root canal therapy as necessary. And what I did is after doing the pulp testing, it became pretty clear that the tooth is non-vital. And the question now was, why is the lesion on the side? In your experience, Andy, what are some of the potential reasons you could see large Outside lesions on the side? Outside of non-odontogenic uh, lesions, when we're looking at something like this, generally a lesion on laterally is going to be something that's a result of either a fracture or a lateral canal. One of the things that strikes me looking at this for the first time here is that you have a pretty large canal that all of a sudden kind of goes away. Uh, many times when things like that where you have a canal break, it's not because of calcification, it's because there's a bifurcation or a trifurcation or some kind of aberrant anatomy. Uh, so this case, um, you know, the, the critical thing to me is I'm going to ask you, did this case probe? Was there any periodontal probing? So there was a very significant and important aspect of differentiation for cracks and fractures versus just uh, regular side lesions. There was no probing. That's, the probing was normal around the tooth. That's good for the prognosis. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's fair to say that when you see lesions on the side of the tooth and the pulp is necrotic, then you would assume that the source is odontogenic. Right. So you're absolutely right, the non-odontogenic ones that are just pure right. uh, cysts and so yes. on could be eliminated as a source. Uh, but you could also have a granuloma that could in time result into a right. cyst and cause a little bit of displacement as we can see here if it's been a long-standing right. uh, lesion. And um, those are important things to, to keep in mind, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis 
follow-up right. uh, of the patient. And, and if this happened to be a mandibular uh, premolar rather than a maxillary premolar, I would be very concerned uh, uh, about having a post-op follow-up because one of the things we've seen in the donics, we've seen a lot of non-odontogenic things metastasize or show up around mandibular premolars. But this is a maxillary premolar, so the fact, according to your findings, I think most likely this is probably going to be some type of large lateral canal or something like that. Yeah, uh, uh, large lateral canal and so on. And, and uh, so what we're going to do first is uh, I always like to start the case by having an estimated length in mind to see. And here we see about a 19 millimeter by measurement from the radiograph. Uh, the pan shows at the teeth as well. And we zoom in on this tooth. And now taking an axial uh, section through this tooth using the X800, the JMORD X800 CBCT, has a very high resolution and little noise. And you can see right here at this level of that. the tooth, so we're cool. seeing a small little exit from the main canal on the distal lingual aspect of the premolar. And looking at the sagittal section now, we can see the same thing that the tooth comes in and right at the base of that area where the fast break was, there is a little side lateral canal is fairly large that it can be visualized radiographically. And even here on a coronal yeah. section, this the lesion is fairly large. That's really pretty that's, amazing. That's pretty cool that you can see a lateral yes. canal like that. Yeah. Of course, it's mm -hmm. a large enough size. And that's what's nice with big. this uh, X800 uh, unit, you have very high resolution. So you're able to see that level of detail. And uh, so we are now ready to access after isolation. You can see the core is in place. I'll take the saber cut burr from the rolled endo access kit and very quickly just get in there. We're gonna skip through the access, but it's important for it to be straight lined so that we can have completely unroofed and show the buckle and the lingual aspect of an oval tooth like this, which you could see from the uh, section, from the axial section. Now, when I look deep into the tooth at high magnification, I'm seeing a little bit of a foam-like substance and some type of material in the middle of the tooth. I would assume it's some type of an exudate coming in from the lateral canal from the large lesion. So it achieves secondary isolation, which is important to uh, prevent any crevicular fluid seepage and backwards. And I wanted to use a small ultrasonic here. I'm using a 20U file to go in there and try to just remove that nice. um, foamy material, just in case if there is any hard substance to mm -hmm. it or any calcification, any deposits, I do need to remove that so it doesn't get lodged as soon as I put a file in the canal and cause a blockage. So. Here we just go a little higher magnification and it looks much, much cleaner now. And this is the protocol that I'm going to use, Annie. The blend protocol is the idea of using, as we mentioned, non-heat treated with heat treated files, getting efficiency from the non-heat treated and then getting some flexibility from the heat treated files. And I'm going to combine the endo sequence, conventional original endo sequence 2506 right. with the endo sequence CM, which is a new addition that's heat treated over the endo sequence. And um, this is the idea of doing a crown down with 2506 and then to 1506, get my working length and then get the 2506 right. down to the apex. I also like to use a little bit of a chelating agent here. I'm using the uh, Canal Clean, which is a combination of a, um, um, of, of EDTA and some surfactants as well as some antiseptic. So yes. it's not pure uh, EDTA, but people who may not want to use the canal clean can use just pure EDTA. Anything else, Annie, you would recommend at this point for softening things up yourself? Do you uh, use I, any? I love the fact that you have using a surfactant with an EDTA, uh, that combination. I mean, EDTA by itself is great, but I think with a surfactant, because of the surface tension, it works even more effectively. And coming in behind this, obviously, with an ultrasonic is going to really start to clean three-dimensionally. Exactly. So here now, I'm going to introduce the first file, which is the 2506 endo sequence. That's the non-heat treated nice. one. And I'm essentially just using in a straight uh, motion. I'm getting three OTR motions out of it. This is put on the endosync plus hand piece that is able to do almost forward reciprocation motion. So setting it at an uh, angle of reciprocation of about 180 to 30, I do three equivalent of the original rhythm motion, three motions of that and drive it pretty much pretty close down to the end and then take the 15 now 
And the 15, as you can see, already is reaching apex. the apex. Right. So by cutting down the, the, the burden between two files, the 25, the 15 is reaching the apex. My assistant is setting up the um, adjusting the stopper. The EndoSync Plus, you can program it so that when it reaches apex, it comes to a full stop. Nice. And that's nice, it's very helpful. Uh, because then the assistant can set up the thing and then I measure the length and it comes out to be 19 millimeters. What I do is with these new irrigation tips that uh, we've uh, introduced also that are close-ended side vented needles that have a stopper on them, right. you can set the length and this is 31 gauge needle so you can go pretty deep down already with the 1506 down to right. the end, it's pretty close to the apex with the irrigation needle. So I'm still using however the canal clean on there and the goal is to still keep on loosening things up, Annie, and make sure that I kind of try to um, dislodge and, and soften up the biofilm. And now I put the 25 in there, and the 25 also reached the apex. So I have a shape of a 2506 already prepared. And then I go back and do a little bit of brushing using the, again, the same 25. Uh, and intermittently use the canal clean, you could use EDTA, and then activate that right. with the ultrasonic and do that about a minute or so using the ultrasonic and then I go ahead and use a large volume of uh, full strength hypochlorite in negative pressure irrigation protocol and alternate here with the ultrasonic. The goal here is to put the hypochlorite in there using negative pressure and then activate it with the ultrasonic and then put some new one. And you can see how much foaming you get from the hypochlorite. So you're, you're by that really action. cleaning and disinfecting this in a three-dimensional manner. Absolutely. Yeah. This is wonderful. I mean, that, at. that is the focus here it's is that vortex. it's not just creating a shape, yeah. but you really have to keep thinking about the biofilm. That's the main goal to remove the biofilm. So once the 2506 shape has been created, we know that it's going to match with the 2506 in the sequence uh, cones. And uh, here, what I decided to do is to take a file, put a big bend on it, almost like a 90 degree uh, J hook on it. And then knowing from the CT on the axial section, the distal lingual orientation and the location of that lateral canal to see if I could put an I do. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. So managed to put that file in there. And that's a little bit important. I didn't really go in there and go crazy going up and down because clearly that could put right, a lot of debris out the, uh, into the lesion that could cause potential post-op issues. So uh, the whole idea was to just kind of put it through there so we can have some kind of patency through there. What's very cool is you purposely tried to do that as opposed to finding out you know, with a surprise that you did that. Yeah. That was terrific. And well, that all goes with, uh, with pre-diagnostic knowledge and information that is all now, you know, a hallmark of this having a good uh, imaging ahead of time that will help you quite a bit. And here I'm using the minimal waste tips now to deposit some sealer. At this point, Annie, the key here is to not get overzealous and inject uh, a lot of Very sealer much. in there with right. a lot of pressure and get that jammed in there. You could end up getting a big overfill right. through that mid-canal, lateral mm -hmm. canal. So it's important to know that. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of general practitioners make is they use too much sealer. Yes. So yeah, too much sealer, and especially if the sealer is being bound, the tip of the needle, and that's part of the reason why the new minimal waste tips mm -hmm. are more helpful than the tips that the sealer comes with, right. because that big taper on the tip of the sealer um, could potentially can get lodged in there, and as you inject, you bind it, it creates, mm -hmm. you know, the, you yeah. don't have any backflow potential, it can only go down. So people do tend to get overfills or tend to jam the needle in there and get it like right. completely. And the same thing can happen with the irrigation needles. Right. So that's the key is to make sure that the needle is always loose, whether it's irrigation or whether it's uh, the sealer. So I deposit the sealer and I use the file to gently push it down to the full working length. And I take the lightly coated uh, cone and I gently seed it. Here the idea is not to, sh you know, you don't want to visualize that oh, I'm trying to fill a lateral canal very hard. It will fill by itself passively. You just want to make sure that you are um, um, not overfilling it, if you will. And so I seat the cones to length, mm -hmm. and I take the EndoPro 270 at about 270 degrees, and I melt the gutta percha right at the CEJ level, Annie, and while it's still a little bit molten at that it's top one millimeter, take a very large plugger and then plug it down, so almost like a nail head, it covers the entire orifice of the canal, 
and go especially focus on the margins of the preparation so of the uh, at the cable surface margins so that it's nicely sealed and there's obviously now some sealer on the canal walls and to remove that the fastest way is to use like a ball ultrasonic and quickly with water it'll wash out very quickly now I always come back at that point and use a size 9 or 10 uh, plugger right at the cable surface margins of the gutta percha with the dentin to make sure that that area is going to mm -hmm. seal down. Um, here in this case, I didn't put the core in there because the prosthodontist was going to do that. So I just put a little bit of cavity in the axis preparation and I re-cemented the temporary. And you can see here that we have a final fill. There's a little lateral canal is filled over there and there's a little bit of fin as, as well. And uh, now, this patient was a radiologist, actually, he's a physician <laughs> radiologist. So of course. When I told her the story of all of the stuff, she was very curious to see how it got filled. So we decided to take a post-op uh, 3D image of the tooth as well. And you can see now on the axial section right there, there's a little bit of cone uh, beam hardening. So there's a little bit of this array rays of thing coming out. But you could clearly see the fill of the sealer into that lateral canal. And you can see it here now in the sagittal section as well on the distal aspect. As we go distal, you can see that it's popping right over there. And it's filled right there. There's a little bit of a puff outside, which is not uh, consequential at all. And then That's now we're going to cool. just move to look mm -hmm. at it from the, uh, from the coronal section. And we can see that little dot, uh, Annie. That's pretty right cute. There. That is the sealer has filled the dot. And that, that dot represents the lateral canal that has been now filled with the bioceramic sealer. And here it is, a three-dimensional look at uh, the tooth. After stripping away the tooth, now we're just seeing the radio-opaque material, which is the gutta percha and the sealer. And we can see that it's uh, kind of filled um, nicely in there and uh, one big cohesive mass. That's like mass. such a cool image. Look at that. Yeah. So that kind of shows the case and what do you think Annie now yourself with uh, having a lateral canal such as this one right. filled using this modern hydraulic condensation with a bioceramic compared to what the vertical condensation people used to, to talk about as requiring heated gutta percha and zinc oxide eugenol sealer well, or resin sealer. It's, it's really interesting uh, addressing that question here in Boston obviously the home of warm vertical but it's not just warm vertical, it's also thermoplastic, like carrier-based, things like that. You know, when I went back to endodontic training, I never understood the concept of the sealers. Why are you using resorbable sealers? And as, then as we evolved going into the late 1990s and, and 2000s with this push with warm vertical, what happens when heated gutta percha cools? I mean, it, it shrinks. shrinks. It shrinks like 7 8%. So why would you want to have that ideally in a lateral canal if you rather could have a biologic sealer, in this case a bioceramic sealer, that when it sets doesn't shrink and it doesn't resorb. So to me it, it's clearly very different what I would rather have. So if I had a bifidity, a lateral canal or a delta, my preference, a strong preference, is to have a, a bioceramic sealer in those little slots rather than heated gutta percha. No, absolutely, no because in my mind. Not, not only the fact is that it's hydrophilic and that it actually will uh, bond to, to those areas and it doesn't shrink, right. it's also antimicrobial. Right. So it's it'll give deal. you one extra element that gutta right. percha doesn't have. Right. Thermoplastic gutta percha is inert, right. whereas um, a bioceramic material, once filling those lateral canals, will have a deleterious effect on the biofilm. What I think is really cool about this case is that you used you know, mechanical principles, obviously, biologic principles, and you also took advantage of the latest metallurgy and material science changes. This is where endodontics is going. It's not just technology, it's technology in combination with long-established evidence-based techniques. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So for this case, what do you think are some of the uh, take-home messages for a case like this? Now, what's interesting also, let me add that yesterday, now we did the case on Thursday, but I called the patient right. yesterday to check on her to make sure she was doing well. And um, 
she was doing fine. She said she, she had just that night, she had to take one Advil, and that was it. And uh, this during the day when I called her, she said she was doing fine. Now, um, follow-up is an important thing, Annie, yes. in these cases. Why well, do you think follow-up well, is really important? It's really a follow-up because, again, you know, we're assuming, of course, that this is this lesion, this fairly large lesion, is odontogenic-driven. But, again, you have to be concerned that is it really odontogenic? Yeah, we're really, really convinced. But just to be on the safe side, bring the patient back, Make sure that lesion is starting to heal. If it's not starting to heal, is that, as you said, is it a granulomatous thing that has moved to the side, or is there a other, some other type of diagnostic thing associated with it? But when you have a lesion that big, you absolutely need to have the patient come back, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I think ideally, uh, we should have all patients right. come back. The problem is patients don't, come, don't back. come back. I it's mean, we send every back. patient a letter <laughs> to come back for a free right. uh, follow-up radiograph, but they don't come back because they're busy in the tooth doesn't hurt, so they don't want to come back. But this is an important thing, Annie. I think we should really emphasize this because currently there is, as I see this on the internet all the mm -hmm. time, people saying, oh, root canals don't have a good success rate, they don't work, and so on. Like anything else, any procedure that is not done correctly will not work. And even if it's done correctly, in some cases, the anatomically, they may not work. So the follow-up is the part where you find out where things are working or not. 1,000%. And I think another takeaway from this is really look at your pre-op x-rays, cone beams, whatever type of diagnostic measures you're using. I used to have an expression with my residents, why do you always take the x-ray after you break the instrument, <laughs> right? If you take a look at that x-ray beforehand and really go through it and do a kind of a, a deeper evaluation, you're going to see a lot of these kind of little crazy little anatomical things that's going to help you in terms of instrumenting and then filling that case. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's so many layers to these cases, and of course, we don't want to have this video go too long. Right. But I really appreciate you spending oh, your day fine. here right before Pleasure. going back uh, to to Florida. And by the way, speaking of that, I should come by and visit you in Florida absolutely. at your it's home and do a little players. interview over there, Please. because I know you're an avid tennis right. player, and I'm just learning. I'm not that good, Squash but I would love player. to learn from you. <laughs> so I'll definitely come by, and maybe we'll play. And um, thanks again for joining my, me. Absolutely, my pleasure. Terrific. So until then, for We Will Dendo, I'm Ali Nisse. And I'm Ann Koch. And let's save some tea. But I thought it was a great opportunity, Al, to talk, especially for the young dentist, how to get the most out of a hands-on course. It's so important because people go to the didactic courses, learn a lot of theory. Right. Right. But then it's always when the rubber meets the road is when you're on a hands-on course and you're actually trying to use the systems and the techniques that you've been taught. And, and one of the things, for instance, today is depending on some of these state meetings, we had 25 people. Only one person went to my six hours of lectures yesterday. Yeah. So, the, so I think one of the first tips is that if you're going to come to a hands-on with a specific technique, try to go to the lecture before that, whether it's the same day or the day before, because you just get a lot more out of the hands-on if you've already been you know, exposed to the technique. Yeah, that, that's a huge uh, uh, problem that I often see too, is people think that we'll just go to the hands-on, that's right. all I care about is to learn how to use the system. Right. But there's a lot of theory that goes into a lot of these systems. It yes. isn't like a composite course where everything else is the same, you're just using a different right. material. Right. There's a whole and, ideological difference between these different systems. And, and you know, when you're lecturing all day in endodontics, you talk about all kinds of different sidebars. And you know, people come in with all these different questions, but the hands-on component is mainly kind of procedural based in terms of instrumentation, taking it to the obturation, taking it to the post. Yeah, so tip one, make sure you attend the lecture prior to the hands-on. And don't skip it because you know it all right, and go exactly. straight to the hands-on. Right. Okay. What is the second tip? Second tip for me personally, I think people should make a real effort to bring at least one or two extracted teeth and access them. Because instrumenting on blocks uh, is nothing like working on dentin. And I know sometimes people say, well, I can't get them through TSA. Well, if you're traveling, put them in your whole baggage. Um, and again, most state meetings, people are coming in locally. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to bring extracted teeth. But I think extract the teeth exponentially add to the value of a hands-on. There's no question about it because people oftentimes learn these hands-on because of the practical aspect of it. People end up using resin blocks right. or at best printed teeth that right. are still resin, none of which are actual like real teeth 1, that are hydroxyapatite based, right. Right? <laughs> which is basically what you, you need to have. So in fact, from a business side, there have been some companies that have kind of focused on finding the perfect resins that cuts best for their uh, files 
and files that do better on resin. Right. And that's right. not the right. way it is right. because ultimately yes. any of these things that perform so well on Hazard have to be used on a clinical, on a patient. That's why you're buying There's it. There's a degree for that. That's a block A block right. <laughs> Or a blockhead. Right, right. <laughs> but again, what Ali's talking about here, so we've talked about, you know, attending that, you know, lecture as a precursor. We've talked about bringing natural teeth. I think the other thing here just takes a little bit of effort is do a little bit of reading beforehand on the technique. Uh, because sometimes, you know, you'll go to a hands-on, could be in whatever type of field of dentistry, and it's a fairly strict departure. So instead of coming in and, and kind of losing valuable time because you're trying to figure it out, you know, spend 15 minutes the night before at home getting a handle on what that person is going to be doing during a hands-on. And one other tip uh, that I can also add, uh, Annie, is that if you're currently using a system that you're happy with or even if you're not happy with, oh, yeah. bring a few files Absolutely. That's from a great, that system great tip. so you can yes. compare to whatever yes. is being used. Great tip. When you know, we were first doing rotary things many, many years ago, we would have all the different rotary systems and people could do it. Now that's kind of gone away. So I think that's a great tip about bringing what you're using, compare it, and you make the decision. Yeah, because ultimately the question is how does it feel in your hands? And uh, you need to have a comparable. If you're used to a certain way and you have now being introduced to something new, you need to know how it compares to the other system that you have. So these are all great tips. I, I think they're really important tips. And with the all day lecture yesterday and now two days of hands-on all sold out, Annie. You're, right. uh, you're quite popular and, uh, <laughs> and it, it's really a testament to all the experience it must, and knowledge must be you the have. glasses. <laughs> and, uh, no, no, it's, 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 it's wonderful. I've obviously uh, been blessed to have been taught by you, so uh, I, I know why these people are so interested in attending your courses. So, uh, Dr. Ann Koch's uh, lectures and presentations and seminars are going to be found on our seminar section of therealworldenda.com. You can check them out and go see her in, uh, in person and uh, learn from her wisdom and experience. And thanks for you coming around, helping out today with the hands-on. It's, it's a great, great boon to the success of the hands-on itself. So thanks. Let's enjoy the Yankee, and thanks so much, guys. Thanks.